Through the prayers of our holy fathers and mothers, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Amen. Glory to thee, O God, glory to thee. O heavenly King, the comforter, the spirit of truth, who art everywhere present and fillest all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us, cleanse us from all impurity, and save our souls, O good one. Kudus on Allah, Kudus on il Tawi, Kudus on il Lazil Ayamul Tulhana, Kudus on Allah, Kudus on il Tawi, Kudus on il Lazil Ayamul Tulhana, Kudus on Allah, Kudus on il Tawi, Kudus on il Lazil Ayamul Tulhana. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. We say together, Most Holy Trinity, have mercy upon us. O Lord, wash away our sins. O Master, pardon our iniquities. O Holy One, visit and heal our infirmities for thy name's sake. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. And as we're drawing the face of our Blessed Mother, let us turn to her and say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, yesterday, um, I mentioned to you about um, geometry and the way in which mathematics um, and that profound understanding of the unity of creation bearing the fingerprint of God was the the vision of art which very much lies behind the Byzantine aesthetic and um, this is a book by Gervais Matthew called Byzantine Aesthetics and there's a nice little quotation in here which I thought I would uh, share with you um, which explains this point even more clearly. And I'm going to read this little passage to you. Like his friend St. Gregory Nazianzen, St. Gregory of Nyssa conceived man as the bridge linking the two worlds in which all being was divided. For them, both the crucial text was Genesis 2-7. God had formed man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. By reason of his body, man belongs to the world of matter. By reason of his soul, he belongs to the world of mind. In man alone, mind and matter, the worlds of noetos and estheotos intermingle and interpenetrate. Through man alone, the material becomes articulate in the praise of God. Without him, mind and sense remain distinct within their boundaries, bearing within themselves the magnificence of the creator Logos, but praising silently. Nor was there any mingling between them, nor yet were the riches of God's goodness manifested, till man was placed on earth as a kind of second world, a microcosm, a new angel, a mingled worshipper, visible and yet intelligible to be the husbandman of immortal plants. This is perhaps as close as we ever will get 
to the Byzantine conception of the essential function of all forms of religious art. Because man is body, he shares in the material world around him, which passes within him through his sense perceptions. Because man is mind, he belongs to the world of higher reality and pure spirit. Because he is both, he is in Cyril of Alexandria's phrase, God's crowned image. He can mold and manipulate the material and render it articulate. The sound in a Byzantine hymn, the gestures in a liturgy, the bricks in the church, the cubes in the mosaic are matter made articulate in the divine praise. All become articulate through becoming part of a rhythm. In the world of matter, they have become echoes of harmonies in mind of the, in the mind of what in the world of mind. This could explain the crucial importance of mathematics for Byzantine aesthetics. So just to show I'm not making all of this up, uh, it's got some good sound basis. So today what I want to do is complete the drawing and transfer it to the board and um, in the final session today, I'm going to be preparing it to receive the gold, which I will do tomorrow. Um, tomorrow's sessions, because it's going to be the gilding, um, I think we'll probably be all in the morning. So it's sort of a consistent flow. Um, and I'm sorry about that for those of you who will um, be coming in uh, in a different time zone that will make that difficult. But um, the, the videos will be up there. So, if we look at the, um, the image, what I want to do is to look at the eyes and the mouth and then at the garments and how, how they're constructed. So, we'll start now, have a break like yesterday and then come back. Um, I decided to keep with the free programme for now, not least because 40 minutes is probably enough for um, any one time and it shuts me up. So that's perhaps to your advantage. So let me go back to the screen share. Here we are. So I want to now look at the mouth and the eyes. Try and bring those up. As you can see, you might think, oh, that, that drawing's finished, but no, this is just um, steps along the way. And one of the keys to improving your iconography is being able to push yourself at every stage to become more and more self-critical. Um, so rather than thinking, oh, that's just awful, or, oh, well, I'm quite pleased with that, um, nothing more I can do with this, it's being able to see what's good and say, yeah, actually, no, that works. That's okay. That's got that flow. That's got that shape. Um, those are balanced or whatever. But then pushing yourself to be critical and saying, oh, what about that there? So if you want any skill to take away from this course, the ability to be self-critical, um, I think, would be probably the most valuable skill you would find. And that also relates to the spirituality of the iconographer, which is about humility. And if, if we really understand what humility is, it's a, the ability to see accurately, to see ourselves in the great scheme of things and to um, be able to be honest with ourselves without having to hide um, behind the furniture, as it were, from, from ourselves. So the icon challenges us in in a way to grow in humility um, just these simple exercises of being able to stand back from our ego and see what what we've actually done without pretending it's useless and rubbish because that's actually a form of ego as well it's an excuse not to really look at what i've done um, it's it's just jet so general it doesn't um, impact so as i'm looking at my my drawing here um, trying to find the, the, the flow 
generally. So if I put a, a blank piece of paper under here again, Very important, by the way, to keep going backwards and forwards. Use the the, the geometry to, to give it its um, inner dynamic, but you do have to look at the whole. So if I look at this, one of the things, the first things I can see is, you see the bonnet here, it's too far out. It's not got that elegance. So I'm going to move my piece of paper like that. And using my hand like a, like a compass, I've got a sort of fixed point. Going to neaten that up and then I can take off line around there. Now, back. Let's check that, turning it back round. See, that's much better. Now there's this flow that's fairly continuous. And now the next thing I want to do, you see where the um, folds are um, in the bonnet? That's because it's coming round off the top of the head. So if you think of a, of a ball, a bit like, um, you see this here, it's sort of over the top and sort of going round. So what's, um, so it's got a sort of point and it's going to come radiating from, a, from the same point. So all these lines have to relate to, as it were, the top of the, the ball. So here they, they work all right. You see they're sort of resting. Maybe that can come in just a little bit there. So it's not so uh, deformed combination of gravity pulling it down and the the shape underneath giving it its its form and then don't be afraid to move your drawing around so that you can get nice flowing lines so from the same point want to get that and then from here as well bringing it up So all the lines are pointing to this point here. If I get a, a cloth, let me explain what I mean. Back to the other screen for a moment. So if you've got a, a piece of cloth and I put my fist underneath, it's the fist is sort of making a resistance and the gravity is pulling um, the cloth down. So where the edges are here, it's where the, the cloth sort of suddenly goes down, and they're all pointing upwards to this form. So we really need, when we're doing the, the bonnet of Mary, to think of it as, um, as a ball. Um, I wonder if I've got something round here. Nope. Uh, but I think you got the, the, the general gist of the meaning. Oh, wait a minute. Let me use this. It's a little stamp. So there's, see how you can tell that that's a rounded top, the way in which where the creases stop and where they are pointing to. So you've got like um, little arrows which start at the top and get wider as they're coming down. But all those points relate to the shape underneath. So notice wherever, where the, where the edge comes. So gravity here has got no resistance. As soon as it's got a resistance from the push up of the, of the um, circle, the shape, that starts affecting the way the cloth falls over. Okay. So let me go back to my drawing. Now then. 
Pen 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 up to the front. I'm trying to bring the camera back up again so you can see the There we are. Okay. So now, can you see there's a nice rhythm? It's all pulling around. So it's, it's creating the sense that this is a, a bonnet or a head um, with the bonnet pulling round over the top. Why am I getting that right at this stage when I'm talking about the features? I'm going to look at eyes and mouth because the context presents the features. So if the if you get the context wrong, it's very difficult to see whether the um, eyes, the nose and the mouth are resting well. Um, and a lot of times people get straight into the features and they really ignore the context, but the context presents it. And it's a little bit like if you've got a, say you've won a cup for playing cricket and you want to put it on a, on a display stand, if you just sort of stick it in the corner of a cupboard, you don't see it. But if it's on a stand and it's placed um, and arranged within a cabinet, that enables you to see the cup better. So in the same way, the clothing in the icon, the arrangement of the um, parts of the body, like the head in relationship to the hand, it presents the face, which is where we experience communion between ourselves and the, the saint. So at this stage, it's, it's good to get that nicely established. Once you've got that, then you can say, well, is this movement within the face creating a tranquility? Because these are images for prayer. We need to understand that we need to create a tranquil space, a harmonious um, resting within the design. So if you get the eyes in the wrong place or the wrong size or the mouth and the nose are not really lining up, when it comes to praying with the icon, people are being distracted rather than drawn in. And it's one of the criticisms I'd make of a lot of art that's in a church is it's just distracting for all sorts of different reasons. And a lot of the icons which are painted by people who are maybe not really well trained and are very well-meaning amateurs, but why they're not suitable in church is because they're just a little distracting. They're fine in a home setting, and especially when they've been painted with a lot of love and prayer. But in the public space, the icon has a public duty and a certain standard should always be insisted upon. Um, and of course, unfortunately, a lot of clergy, as a lot of lay folk, um, think that um, just that icons look odd. So therefore, the more odd that the icon looks, the better icon it must be. Well, actually, we all know that there's a, there's a good look in the icon and a bad look in the icon. And this is the sort of thing that does make a difference. So. Um, making sure the harmony and flow within the icon creates tranquility is one of your key um, decisions. So I'm looking at this now. So there's that nice flow around the face and the hand here is following these lines round and bringing it round here. And then it's sort of opening up across here. 
And that is then echoed with the shape of the cloth in Mary's hand. And the way that that's shaped, it creates, as it were, a, a, a meeting point between the hand and the face. So the weight of Mary's sorrow is being emphasized here. And the hand and the cloth begin to speak. So we've got a movement across here, across the eyes, met with the hand, which creates uh, a sort of stability point. And then the cloth is, is like a fountain of tears. So it's sort of coming down here and then flowing out. It's, it's, it's like a fountain. It's almost as though Mary's tears are, are, are cascading outwards. So something as simple as the shape of this cloth and the position of the hand become really expressive. And because iconography is taking down the image to its, its basics, to its fundamentals, something as simple as this becomes incredibly articulate. The lines, the positions are all speaking. Now, when a lot of people who do iconography just simply trace and copy an existing um, icon, this is the thing that quickly gets lost because, you know, when you're tracing, it can be very inaccurate. And you only need half a millimeter here and another half a millimeter there, and the whole unity of the composition begins to fall apart. So it's much, much better, I think, um, to really train yourself um, to want to observe very critically and to do that through actually trying to draw from scratch. And then even if you go back to tracing the image, you do so with understanding a little bit more accuracy. So make those flow as well. You don't want them just sort of all over the place. They got to relate to each other. So they're being held in this hand. They're coming up and then going over there. One of the things that you find a lot in garments is that they make um, arrow shapes. So they're wider and then get narrow. And even here on, on Our Lady's bonnet, it's taking you from here to here where the, the relative sizes are smaller. Here you see it more accurate, more clearly. Wider, smaller. Wider, smaller. So these act like arrows and they send your eye on a journey. So it's going over the circle from here up to here. And then it's going down around here. So it's up and down and then through the hand here, the side of the face here, echoed by the flow of the nose here, through the mouth down to the chin. And then the eye is resting right in the center of this movement. Because this movement is very, very beautifully constructed, the eye ends up resting at the center. So if you think of a wheel that's spinning round, the, 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 um, the hub at the beginning um, is staying still while everything else is moving. So have a look at your, your construction. Have a look at the place of your eye. Is it really the still center? Once you've got that, then, we, then you can begin to refine the eye itself, okay? So we've got about uh, eight minutes, five, six minutes left. Mm. Now we've got nine minutes left, so um, I want to look at the eyes now. And then after we have the break, um, we'll come back um, and I'll, I'll look at the mouth. So if we look at the eye, remember the eye socket that I was talking about yesterday. So here, 
that relates to the bottom of the eye socket. You can put your finger there. And those of us who got older, the, the bag under the eye has become really loose and sinks round underneath the eye. That's why it's in shadow, because it's going underneath the eyeball. So that's that shape there. And it's coming up the side of the nose there. And then you've got the eyebrow here. And then that's coming up and over and round the eye there. Then the eye is really centered to that. Now I noticed some people who'd send me their, their images, the eyeball was right up here. You'd not sort of left enough room between the eyebrow and the top of the eyelid, which is there, and then where the eyelash goes there. Everything had sort of been crushed. So make sure there's enough of a gap between here. Same on the, the other side. And then in the icon, the, the, to give a sense of elegance, the eyeball is more of an egg shape than a, so it's more of that sort of shape, more of an oval than a circle. In nature, the icon, the, the, the eyeball is, is, a, is a sphere, but in the icon, it's slightly flattened. And that gives a sort of elegance to the composition. So if you notice here, the iris is not a circle. It's actually slightly flattened. So slightly wider here and thinner there. That's, that's very important. And that's echoed with the, um, with the pupil. Another thing to watch is, okay, so here is the, the eye, eye, eyelash. And rather than lots of little lines, it's just a, a, a calligraphic line, a thin, thick, thin line. And then notice the, where the iris comes up and meets that eyelash. You see that? the eyeball is coming into a point. Now, a lot of people will make a bit of a mistake, especially when they're, they're new to this. Um, let me find my little bit of paper here. And they'll do the eyelid and they'll do the, eye, the iris and the pupil like that with the line cutting through. Now, when you do that, you make the, the person look half asleep. So what you need to do is make sure that that really tucks in there and there, and then the same on the other side. So bring that in and that in. So the line is just sort of at the top of where the, the, so we make it not a round shape, but an oval shape, and we tuck it in at the top and bring that down maybe a little bit further, like that, okay? So if you look here on mine, you can see it, it nicely tucks in top and bottom, so it's not looking asleep. Oh, no, somebody's asking me a question. Let's see what that is. Ah, students, please turn off your cameras, okay? Yes, I am on the circle drawn yesterday. If I take, um, that was just so that it was easier to see. Now you can see how that's relating to the the construction underneath. Okay, so this is continuing to build on, on what we did yesterday. Okay, so we've got put this underneath just to just to make it easier to see. And I encourage you to do this as well, so that you're constantly looking backwards and forwards from the 
construction, which gives you the energy, the, um, the strength of the design, to then looking at the whole. So that's what I'm doing here. So I've tucked that in there. The eye, it sweeps up because it's from the side and then sort of comes down quite steeply. And here, it's coming round that eyeball. Remember the eyeball is um, circular, it's a sphere. So make sure you get that rounded shape at the end there, okay? If you make it too much, it'll make it look as though she's had a stroke. So be careful. If you do it too less, it makes it look very crude um, and folky. So try and bring that sort of at 90 degrees almost from that top line and bring it down around here. And then the top of the eyelid, it's wider here and then comes narrower and comes down quite swiftly and is narrower there. And then we've got just here a few lines for the eyebrow. So it's thicker at this end and then it's trailing off that end. Okay, so, and it's the same principles here, wider in the middle, coming round to closer at the ends, nice oval shape, and then tucking in underneath there, and then we've got that nice shape for the, um, the shadow beneath the eyes. And you see how they're really expressive, really expressive, showing um, sorrow, by the way in which you've got the eyebrow, see that little curve from it's sort of from the top down, just gives that slightly furrowed brow look. Okay. Don't make that too narrow here so that the eye nicely sits into it. And here, bring it up so it's like that. Don't worry too much about um, the shading and stuff around here now. That will come when we paint. Okay, all right everybody, it's just about to stop, less than a minute, so I'll see you in about 10, 10 minutes time. Okay, bye for now.